Good morning, everybody. Boketov. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm supposed to be speaking to you about the role the media played in shaping public opinion to support the Munich Agreement. I should uh, make a disclaimer at the very beginning that I'm a journalist. I'm not a historian. Um, and even more than uh, my shame and ignominy at being a journalist, um, I'm someone who has worked and do work uh, for some of the newspapers who played a totally inglorious role uh, in uh, the Munich debacle. Um, people, when th people think of Britain and the Second World War, they think of 1940 and the Blitz. And if you've seen the movie Churchill, uh, which I highly recommend if you haven't seen it, uh, you will think of Britain in the way that Britain likes to think of itself as we stood alone. We stood alone in 1940 against the Nazi threat, and we were uh, vital in the defeat of Hitler. And that's entirely true. Um, but what's less uh, known, um, and certainly not talked about in Britain, I think at all, uh, is that until uh, the first, until the beginning of the Second World War, um, Britain was the country of appeasement, the country of Munich, the Munich Agreement. When Chamberlain returned from Munich, waving his uh, piece of paper. Uh, and saying peace in our time, uh, he was cheered by Britain to the rafters. So much is reasonably well known. Uh, so the question is why appeasement was so much in vogue in Britain and how important was the media in shaping that view? Now, much has been made of the actual support for fascism by certain newspapers and politicians and their support of Oswald Mosley's Britain's British Union of Fascists, otherwise known as the Black Shirts. In 1933, the Daily Mail, for which I have worked, uh, claimed that British newspapers had been full of, quote, rabid reports of Nazi excesses. Instead, the newspaper claimed of these, these rabid reports weren't true. Instead, Hitler had saved Germany from, quote, Israelites of international, agree of international attachments and from and that the minor misdeeds of individual Nazis will be submerged by the immense benefits that the new regime is already bestowing upon Germany. In January 1934, Lord Rothermere, who owned both the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror, wrote under his own byline articles that appeared in both papers, which were headlined, Hurrah for the Black Shirts and Give the Black Shirts a Helping Hand. And although his support for Mosley uh, in Britain uh, uh, duly waned, he remained, Lord Rothermere remained an admirer of both Hitler and Mussolini, and he met and corresponded with Hitler, even congratulating him on his annexation of Czechoslovakia. But as soon as the war started, however, in 1939, the mail uh, turned, on a, turned on a dime, um, and it reversed its position. Rothermere, uh, that Lord Rothermere died in 1940. His son, Esmond, uh, assumed control of the paper the previous year. And from the outbreak of the war, the Mail did not express any support for Hitler at all. Now, the Mail wasn't the most influential paper. The most influential paper, you could say, uh, was the Times, uh, because it was the mouthpiece uh, um, of the establishment. The editor of the Times until 1941, Geoffrey Dawson, who's already been mentioned, was actually a member of a pro-Hitler group called the Anglo-German Fellowship. It's been claimed, uh, author I think very uh, authoritatively, that Dawson censored the reports by the Times' own correspondent in Berlin at the time, Norman Ebert. A journalist from an American journalist in Berlin at the same time, William Shira, commented, Quote, the trouble for Ebert was that his newspaper, the most esteemed in England, would not publish most of what, much of what he reported. The Times in those days was doing its best to appease Hitler and to induce the British government to do likewise. The unpleasant truths that Ebert telephones nightly to London from Berlin were often kept out of the great newspaper. But in March 1939, the Times also reversed course and called for war preparations. Now, in the political class, there were some members of parliament who supported fascism. Others gave speeches which appeared to defend the Nazi regime or ha they had contact with British fascists in Mosley's outfit. Yet others had sympathies with Italian fascism. To a certain extent, this support for fascism was influenced by the fear of Bolshevism and the belief that fascism was a bulwark against Bolshevism. Uh, 
But in the main, appeasement in Britain and in Britain's media was not driven by support for fascism. There were two principal factors behind the 30s appeasement mindset. The first was widespread pessimism about Britain itself and a deep and fearful certainty of national decline. And the second was, as we've heard already referred to, the extremely deep national trauma inflicted on Britain by the First World War. Now, I know mention has been made of this already, but it's really hard to overstate the impact of the Great War on the British psyche, an impact which is felt I, I, I would suggest very much today and changed uh, everything in Britain and for the worse. Um, the terrible carnage in the trenches wiped out virtually an entire generation of the brightest and best. It destroyed Britain's sense of itself forever. It destroyed its religious faith. It destroyed its faith in the future. It destroyed its belief in the political class. It destroyed its belief in European civilization. And it destroyed its belief in itself. And that remains true today. The war that was supposed to end all wars, the Great War of 14 to, 1914 to 18, was viewed as it is today as senseless slaughter. It was believed, as we've heard, that the harsh conditions of the Versailles Treaty at the end of that war, to prevent Germany from ever again becoming a threat, had caused Hitler to become to power and had caused Germany to become uh, one of the most strong nations in the world. And it was believed that there was simply no way ever to stop the dominance of Germany. If you were going to go to war to stop Germany, you would have to have a war, somebody said, every 20 years to stop Germany. It was hopeless. World War I, in other words, was Britain's own never again moment. Never again would Britain embark on a world war and risk further carnage. Anything would be better than that. Now, this post-traumatic war phobia was amplified by a chronic pessimism about Britain itself. The late 20s and the early 30s saw Britain struggling with the Great Depression. At the empire, the British Empire, was beginning to fall apart with uprisings in India and, of course, here. Economically, uh, Britain was losing out to an expanding Italy, an expanding Germany, and an expanding Japan. So most of the support for appeasement came from a perception of the national interest. With hindsight, we can say this perception of the national interest was wrong. People at the time also said it was wrong, but it was a perception that the national interest would not be served by going to war. Lord Beaverbrook, perhaps the most influential press baron of them all, was who owned the Daily Express. Uh, he was personally anti-fascist. He also thought a European war was not only possible, but uh, even likely. But nevertheless, according to his biographer, A.G.P. Taylor, what Beaverbrook insisted was that Britain need not be involved in such a war, provided she kept clear of European alliances and built up her armament. So he was against Hitler. He was no fascist, but he was a strong appeaser. And he was, I would suggest, uh, well, he was certainly the most influential press uh, uh, individual uh, of the time. So you started, they started from the position that war was unthinkable. Anything was better than that. And as a result, they constructed arguments to justify the fact that war was unthinkable. And that's the mindset of appeasers, isn't it? You start with a, with a, with a, with a proposition uh, that the war is unthinkable, and then you find arguments to make it appear that that is a very rational and logical uh, position. So in the 30s, the appeasers told themselves, for example, that once Hitler's territorial designs on Czechoslovakia were met, his aggression would diminish. A number of appeasers believed that Germany was entitled to rule the Sudetenland. They believed the Sudeten Germans were under foreign domination in Czechoslovakia. And in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Times, uh, the Times ran an editorial supporting the partition of Czechoslovakia. All these appeasers believed that Czechoslovakia was not worth the destruction of the civilization that they believed would be the result of another terrible war. You could, not, you could not say that Czechoslovakia's fate was more important than saving civilization. That's what they thought appeasement was, saving civilization, because it would prevent war. They did not see that they were between a rock and a hard place, that Hitler was intent on destroying civilization, and that in order to save civilization, they had to fight Hitler and defeat him.
Now, there were many voices against appeasement. Many writers in periodicals such as the Fortnightly or Contemporary Review, the New Statesman and Nation, they all went, uh, they all uh, wrote in support of Czechoslovakia. They said Czechoslovakia was being abandoned. They said it was being used as an excuse for Nazi aggression. Letters to the Times expressed horror at the Times' <laughs> own editorial position. The main critic of Hitler in British newspapers was a cartoonist, David Lowe. Now, David Lowe was a socialist, and his cartoons, however, were so popular, he was employed by the London Evening Standard, which was owned by the conservative grandee and arch appeaser Lord Beaverbrook, uh, because he was so popular. Now, Lowe's cartoons attacked Hitler and Mussolini so effectively that his work was banned in Germany and Italy. And after the war, it was revealed that in 1937, the German government had asked the British government to have discussions with the notorious Lowe to get him to stop attacking appeasement. However, most printed opinion was in favour of appeasement. The press overplayed Germany's military invincibility and underplayed Hitler's fanatical and unassuageable ambition to conquer Europe. Now, the great question is this. Does the media shape public opinion, or is the media shaped by it? Now, I can tell you that uh, any uh, successful newspaper editor pays very, very careful attention to what his or her readers actually think. High-minded newspapers, such as The Guardian, make it their business to tell readers what to think, because The Guardian knows better than anyone what people should think, and the readers say they are very happy be being told what to think by The Guardian because they know that that is unarguably right. Popular newspapers, who are read by millions and millions of people, unlike high-minded newspapers, which are read by a few people, popular newspapers wouldn't dream of telling their readers what to think because they would not have any readers left. They reflect what readers actually think. So the idea that the media's narrative actually changes people's opinion is actually a more, it's, that's not true. There's a more complex dynamic that is involved. Now, in the 30s, it was very different from the situation today. The situation today is that people now dismiss the media, the mainstream media, as telling lies, fake news and all that, because there's social media. But in the 30s, there was no alternative to the mainstream media. They had a monopoly of information. And they were a cosy cartel in the 30s with politicians. It's been argued by historians that the press in Britain was manipulated by Chamberlain's government to publish only pro-appeasement articles and news, and so no alternative to the policy of appeasement was ever consistently articulated in the press. And that was uh, true not just of the press, of the national press, uh, but also, you could say, of the BBC, uh, which was perhaps even more guilty of towing the government line regarding appeasement. Now, as uh, the uh, process leading up to the Munich Agreement uh, was, a, was, a, was a tortuous and controversial one, it looked as if there was going to be peace, then Hitler uh, uh, reneged on what he'd said to Chamberlain and so on, and the press went up and down. It, you know, it was peace in our time, then it was terrible, then it was peace in our time again. Munich Agreement was signed, uh, the press and everybody cheered him, to cheer Chamberlain uh, to the rafters, except for certain newspapers. The Guardian, on the day that uh, the paper was signed, uh, the Guardian said, no one in this country who examines carefully the terms under which Hitler's troops begin their march into Czechoslovakia today can feel other than unhappy. Certainly the Czechs will hardly appreciate Mr. Chamberlain's phrase that it is peace with honour. Politically, Czechoslovakia is rendered helpless and Hitler will be able to advance again when he chooses with greatly increased power. And virtually as soon as that piece of paper was, was, was signed, dissenting voices started making themselves heard. And once the war started, of course, it became considered very, very important. To win the war, uh, you, had to Im uh, meet, you had to ensure that there was no loss of morale and defeatism. It was considered absolutely essential that the press should keep the public uh, uh, cheerful, optimistic and committed, because it was understood very, very clearly uh, that uh, public um, 
uh, demoralization uh, had contributed to the defeat of Germany in the First World War, that public demoralization had contributed to the fall of France uh, in the Second World War, and that morale had to be kept up. So finally, what conclusions can we reach as far as today is concerned? Well, as I've said, the public no longer believes the mainstream media to a large extent, but nevertheless, the media has an insidious effect in creating a narrative which sticks, particularly if it's not, um, uh, uh, if, if it's if it's one uh, homo homogeneous narrative, and the BBC in particular is exceptionally important in this respect because the BBC, unlike newspapers which are considered to be you know fake news, the BBC is regarded still as broadly, as entirely trustworthy. What the BBC says is true. And unfortunately, what the BBC says is actually a groupthink narrative which twists reality in accordance with a, a very highly ideological position. During the Iraq war, uh, when I think it was the Ark Royal, the flagship battleship of the British Navy, um, uh, uh, was it the Iraq War or the Falklands War? One of the wars, recent wars, in which Britain was involved, involving its navy, uh, the crew threw its radio into the sea because what the BBC was transmitting was so demoralising that they couldn't fight a war listening to the BBC. That was, that was today. And so there's a groupthink that the BBC reflects, a groupthink about Israel, a groupthink about the nation state, a groupthink about the West, a groupthink about war. The BBC is against them all, and they are all linked. And it's not just uh, the BBC. Um, it's the newspapers in general. It's the intellectual class in general. They all basically cons they all basically agree on one crucial thing. The entire intellectual class thinks this and has thought this. I would suggest going back to the Great War of 1418, but certainly today, that war is unthinkable. That war is senseless. That the slaughter of war is senseless, and nothing can be any better, nothing, nothing can be worse than, than war. And so you have uh, now you know, conflict resolution, uh, which is all the, ra all, all the rage. Instead of war, you sit down and negotiate. Um, and so as a result, because war is unthinkable, you find a number of groupthink ideas which take root, which are all false, but which add to the impression that there is a logical reason to avoid war. So, for example, in the United Kingdom today, you will not find really any newspaper coverage of the threat from Iran. If you ask the public, are they frightened about Iran, they will say, yes, I am very frightened about Iran. What are they frightened of? They're not frightened that Iran's uh, terrorist uh, regime will do them harm. They're not frightened that Iran will can, uh, be successful in its genocidal aims to destroy Israel. They are frightened that there will be war against Iran because then innocent people will die. In Britain, there is virtually no coverage of the thousands of rockets coming in from the south, from Gaza into the south of Israel. Um, that is not a story. What's the, the, the story is only if Israel starts uh, killing Palestinians. Why? Because the only terrible thing is war, when people die who are innocent. Um, and so you have a situation today in which these and many other topics, you have a suppression of information which is important, and in the vacuum, a promotion of a narrative which minimizes, for example, the danger of Iran, which promotes lies about Israel and the Middle East, which labels concern about the Islamization of Europe as Islamophobia, all of which playing exactly the same role in society as the media did in the 30s. So if Britain were fighting World War II today, I'm afraid Britain would lose.